I'll sort that one out for you. So, okay. So the topic I've been asked to talk about today is uh, carers and abuse. Um, I'm, uh, I work as a, an independent reviewer carrying out safeguarding adult reviews and domestic homicide reviews. And you can see my other affiliations on the slide there. Um, so I'm so we're shifting actually from child settings, which was what we were talking about in the previous um, talk to adult settings. Um, and that's that's essentially where I work. So next slide, please. So how I've organised it is um, I've included some thoughts about being a caregiver. Uh, carers and abuse for me, when I think about it, divides into two categories, abuse of caregivers by care recipients. And I'm trying to use caregivers and care recipients just to make clear the distinction between the two and abuse of uh, caregivers by care recipients. Sorry, did I get those two the, the right way around? But it, 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 it works both ways, I guess, is what, what I'm saying. And then something about what we can learn. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? So I looked first of all for a, a definition of a carer or a caregiver, and you can see on the slide one that I've taken from NHS England. Um, and, and essentially, it's someone who looks after a family member, partner or friend who needs help. And you can see some of the reasons why people might need help and can't cope without that person's support. So it covers a wide range of difficulties that people might be having and also the caregivers may um, may cover a wide range of relationships with that individual. Can we have the next slide please? We need to put it within the context of I think domestic abuse um, and as people will know, and I won't go through these definitions in detail, domestic abuse covers both intimate partner violence and adult family violence as well. Uh, and it covers a range of different sorts of abuse, which you've got there. Um, so I won't go through that because I'm sure people have come across these definitions before, but I just wanted to include that as part of the context. Can we go to the next slide, please? I think the terminology gets really complicated because people use other terms that also overlap with domestic abuse and overlap with uh, caregiver or care recipient abuse. Um, so you can see there a definition of elder abuse. Um, so if the person is over the age of 65 or whatever, then sometimes people might use the term elder abuse. Um, but really, we're talking about the same sort of thing. And people also use the term parental abuse, which can be the abuse of parents by their children. And this might be adult children. So this might be something that other people would understand as adult family violence. Uh, and you've got there a definition of carer abuse uh, that I came across. Um, but if you put carer abuse into a search engine and search on it, um, you'll come up with all sorts of difficult, different things. So it's difficult to focus on what you might be wanting to focus on. So can I have the next slide, please? So uh, you, you might think that definitions, it's a bit, um, I don't know, uh, whatever. But, the, but what I'm trying to say is that they overlap. So if you take domestic abuse, which I put in the middle and, and shaded in grey, that would divide out and the two main groups would be intimate partner abuse and adult family violence. Um, but cutting across all of those would be caregiver abuse and care recipient abuse, which might fall into any of those categories. Um, it's obviously not to scale and I couldn't draw it so that things would move around um, in the way that we might want it to move around. And I guess one of the other points that I wanted to make is that if you're looking at an older adult population, because I have an interest in older adults, as well, if you're looking at an older adult population, adult family violence actually in terms of um, domestic homicide reviews is a much bigger slice of the pie. So whereas some people might see domestic abuse 
in, uh, as, as, as more in terms of intimate partner abuse. In older adult terms, adult family violence is, is, is a bigger category and the caregiver and care recipient abuse cuts across. Um, the other thing I wanted to say in connection with that is that most carers, well, I don't know whether it's in connection with that or one of the other uh, slides really, but most carers only want to do a good job. So I think it's difficult when we start talking and thinking about abuse um, because in, in most cases, people are doing a good job, providing a good um, caring of their partner or family member. And, and we need to remember that too. So can I have the next slide, please? Um, OK, so all oh, right. OK, I did two versions of this talk and um, the, the, the version that we haven't got had a slide, I think, at that point, which was about becoming a caregiver. So I'll have to. I'll have do you to want me to? Sorry, Susan, do you want me to just reshare it? I realised as I loaded it literally into okay. the third slide, okay. I can close this one down and reload the newer one. It's no problem. Okay. That, that would be great. Thanks. Otherwise, no worries. I'll do it now. Yeah, thanks. Here is star, Natalie. No worries. Well, at least you can share it. I did. I <laughs> that, that hurdle, no, don't worry. I, I realised, like I say, on the third slide, and I didn't want to interrupt you. And I thought, oh no, right, bear with me. Okay, so I think it's slide seven. Is it that yeah. one? Just slide? Okay. Yeah, just Yeah, that's the one. Lovely, thank you. So, um, people become a carer, a caregiver without informed consent it often creeps creeps up on people or it feels like it's inevitable it can happen imperceptibly it can happen gradually over time uh, people may feel they're not prepared and it gradually becomes their role to be caring for the person uh, that is their relative or is their partner or is their friend um, having said that when that person, when the care recipient is in contact with professionals, with various practitioners, the caregiver may not always be included in, in, in the way that perhaps it would be helpful for them to be included. Or it can happen the other way around, that the care recipient, that their voice isn't heard and they're not included in the way that perhaps they could be included. Um, and the caregiver who's gradually become a caregiver. So so it might be, for example, um, an elderly uh, woman who gradually becomes the carer for her partner. Um, and many of us will have heard people say, I'm not I'm not his carer. I'm his wife. So where is it leading? What are the possible consequences of becoming the carer? Um, do they feel that they have a choice? No, in many cases, people don't feel that they have a choice and they may actually neglect their own needs. They may neglect their own health. Um, there's, there's a literature on what's called filial obligation that I thought was worth mentioning, which is about what might be seen as the duties and obligations of adult children. Uh, whose parents are getting older and maybe needing support and maybe needing care. Um, and I came across an interesting paper which talks about the obligation or the duty being to care about their adult parent and not necessarily to care for their adult parents. So I've put that on the slide uh, as a question for people perhaps to think about. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So what, one of the things that that probably many of us have learned is that being a carer, being a caregiver can be very stressful and, and often is very stressful. Um, and there's what's called caregiver stress theory. So the idea of that is that caring is stressful. And um, it's, it, this, this is a quotation in respect of elder abuse. So the idea is that abuse happens when the overburdened caregiver um, says here unleashes, which is a very strong word, isn't it? His or her negative emotions on the person that they're actually looking after. Um, so that's the idea in terms of caregiver stress theory. And that's one way of looking at it. 
um, and it's taken from this paper about resilience. So uh, we'll mention resilience later on. Can we move to the next slide, please? So what about factors in caregiver resilience? Um, I've got a definition there or a description of resilience bottom right on the slide. So the idea is that it's a resource for the caregivers, uh, which helps them to cope with problems, cope with difficulties, cope with challenges in the caring in a way that uh, doesn't really wear them down. That it says here, it make, helps them feel stronger and wiser than before. That's stating it um, quite strongly, but it's a way of is resilience contributes to people not being worn down uh, when they're in a situation of the stress of caring. But we can also divide the factors in resilience to extrinsic and intrinsic. I've done here and I'm not not claiming that this is a comprehensive list of factors. These are just examples and it may be that people here can think of uh, other factors that we could put on the list. So extrinsic factors would include things like support coming in from outside or support networks for that caregiver. So it may be that they get support from members of their family, from their friends. Um, if, if you're caring for a person with a particular condition, they, they might be a member of a group um, that supports uh, carers caring for people with that condition. Like I, I guess um, the example that springs to mind is Alzheimer's, the Alzheimer's Society um, often runs groups for carers and that's true of other uh, conditions too. There might be economic factors that are a stress. Uh, if people are caring for someone um, and they've got a limited income, uh, it may be that 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 economics um, and having the money to be able to perhaps buy in extra care or whatever, uh, that may be a stressful uh, factor. Housing might be a factor depending on um, the circumstances that people are living in. Um, so sometimes you've got people being cared for in um, crowded multi-generational homes. Um, and so that may well be a factor. Um, and there are also extrinsic factors to the caregiver in relation to the care recipient. So what level of care does this person that they're caring for need? What is their dependency level? Um, sometimes the person might be showing agitated behaviours or challenging behaviours. That can sometimes be the case if someone has a dementia, for example. Um, and then there's also the factor of the prior relationship with that care recipient. Um, did they have a, a, a um, trusting, close relationship uh, before the caring situation arose? Or did they have a, a difficult um, relationship? Although sometimes it works that people have got a difficult relationship, um, but then when they need to be cared for, their relationship with the carer actually changes and, and can be more positive than it was before. So it can work in all different directions, but these are possible extrinsic factors in, in caregiver resilience. Intrinsic factors, um, again, we might think of things like the caregiver's health. Is, is the caregiver in good health? Um, have they got needs that they then neglect? I've known uh, people, I, I knew a man, for example, who was caring for his wife who had a dementia and he needed an operation, but he didn't want to have the operation because he felt he would be neglecting his wife if he went into hospital and she had to be cared for by someone else. Um, and all the obviously different members of the team working with him had conversations with him about how if he neglected his health, he might get into a position where he could no longer care for her. Um, but it was very difficult, if not impossible, uh, almost impossible to persuade him that he ought to look after his own health as well as that of his wife. Um, so health can be a very big factor. Um, resilience can be a very big factor. Uh, because sometimes people have uh, their own challenges like um, un unrecognised. Sometimes people have unrecognised anxiety or depression. 
um, and those can be a challenge, as, challenge to caregiver resilience as well. Um, and again, as I say, you can probably think of some more. So if we go to the next slide, please. Uh, and, and then uh, thinking about care recipient stress. I suppose one of the things that perhaps I didn't realize, um, I, I was naive for, for, for a long time, is that it can be as stressful being looked after as it is being the person who's doing the looking after. Um, and these are some of the some of the factors that might be relevant in the care recipient uh, being stressed. Um, they may have to accept that they've become dependent, that they can't be as independent as they were at one time. How do they feel about their disability or their condition that's um, led to them needing to have care? Um, there's a changed power dynamic in their relationship. Um, so it, it may be that whereas previously um, one, if these are partners, one partner um, doing various things as a contribution to the health of the relationship, now that person's unable to do it. So the uh, carer may have had to take over all sorts of duties and um, demands that previously they didn't take on and that's a big shift in terms of the relationship dynamic between the two of them. The care recipient like the caregiver may have to accept limitations on their life, limitations on their activities, limitations in terms of what they used to enjoy doing and spend their time doing um, in conjunction with the uh, the change in their level of independence and they may not have the same choice in terms of what they do or where they go or how they live their life um, that they're used to having in the past. So that can be quite stressful for someone who needs care. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? And, 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 and it was interesting because I was talking to uh, a woman this morning who um, is having to accept that she's got visual impairment and that she's going blind. Um, and this is what she said. So I, I included it on the slide. How difficult it is to be somebody that everybody wants to support. So she was finding it difficult. She was finding it stressful that all sorts of people, you know, you might think it was brilliant, but all sorts of people were ringing her up and offering her help. But they thought they knew what was good for her. When, when I asked her about it, that, that was the thing that was difficult. It didn't feel to her that they were ringing up and saying, you know, these are the things that we could do to help you. It felt like they were saying, we know what's good for you and you should do this. Uh, and that was making it really difficult for her and really difficult for her to, it was making it, diff it difficult for her to accept help because she didn't feel she was in a position to be able to, um, be quite clear with people that know they were well-meaning, they were offering support, they were really lovely people, but really, I don't want it, I don't need it. Um, and that, for me, resonated with um, the, the difficulties of being a recipient of care and how that could be stressful. Can we go to the next slide, please? So, um, uh, Caregiver stress, care recipient stress. Is that care recipient or caregiver? Anyway, um, I think that should be care recipient stress, shouldn't it? And um, I, I'm getting myself confused here. But there are extrinsic and ex extrinsic and intrinsic factors in the stress that the caregiver experiences and also in the stress that the care recipient um experiences and in some ways they can be the similar similar things um but of course they're working differently because the person receiving care also needs to have support uh, may also have economic factors uh, may also have difficulties with their housing and difficulties in their relationship with people who see themselves as caregivers i mean i guess that's the other thing that i hadn't really uh, brought out in the in the um, slides as as written, but um, I, I I have 
come across one domestic homicide where someone claimed to be the carer of a person and um, was accepted by staff in various practitioners in various settings as being the carer and was saying that the care recipient was falling over and injuring themselves and uh, all the rest of it when in fact it later transpired uh, after the homicide um, that this person was being uh, abused they weren't falling over they were being abused by the person who described themselves as their carer um, so so we have to remember that these things work both ways I know that's difficult but they do they do work both ways um, if we can go to the next slide please so uh, I thought it might be helpful and interesting to um, use a couple of domestic homicide reviews reports as illustrations of this so this DHR um, that that I, I'll describe very briefly here uh, was a care recipient who was killed by their caregiver. Um, the wife was a woman of 74, as you can see, and she had Parkinson's disease and was later diagnosed with Parkinson's disease dementia. Um, she lived at home. She was looked after by her husband. Um, he had a history of relatively mild, I think, depression and anxiety that that people may not have been unduly concerned about. And they'd been married several decades, as you can see. Um, and when a domestic homicide review is carried out, as people will know, you have a scoping period in which you look at in detail what happened over that period. So, so the scoping period for this domestic homicide review went back two years. So over that time, she was living at home. She was cared for by her husband. They were self-funders. I, I mentioned that because I think that's re re relevant uh, sometimes. Um, to the economic stresses. Can we go to the next slide, please? So um, she deteriorated in terms of her physical health, but also in terms of her mental health. Um, so she had Parkinson's disease, her mobility became worse. Um, she had Parkinson's disease dementia, so she was also more confused. She was having hallucinations, as people not uncommonly do in that sort of context. Uh, and she went into hospital after a fall. Um, the family kept in touch with her. They were a very caring family. Her husband was seen as an outstandingly caring person. Uh, but in hospital, they felt that she was deteriorating further. They had various concerns. She didn't always have her Parkinson's disease medication at the time it was supposed to be having. Um, there were difficulties with could people assist her with her mobility and all the rest of it. So the family were keen for her to be discharged and she was discharged. But if, once she got back home, her mobility was much uh, less than it had been prior to her admission. And her husband had great difficulty in managing her. He called up various services asking for help and and uh, people were organising assessments and uh, aids and all the rest of it. But two weeks after her discharge from hospital, both husband and wife were found dead at home. Uh, the husband had overdosed and uh, his wife had been asphyxiated. Um, he had left a note um, as I say, he, they were a very close couple um, and his note said that he didn't want her to go into a home. He felt that things were deteriorating such that she was going to end up having to leave the home and, and go into care. Um, so that was an example of a care recipient who was killed by the caregiver and the caregiver it was caregiver in this case who was seen as uh, an outstanding carer who who had her best interests at heart um, and they'd had a very long lasting relationship. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So uh, the second um, DHR that I'm going to use to illustrate um, the issue of carer abuse um, is a caregiver who was killed by a care recipient. Um, and this was, again, a couple who'd been together for many years and the husband had severe Alzheimer's disease. That's how it was described. Um, scoping period in this case was went back 21 months 
His wife um, looked after him in the community um, and they were self-funders. Um, and, and, and I do mention that because I think that comes out uh, in a number of domestic homicide reviews as, as being a factor. Uh, next slide, please. So um, the, she had difficulty coping with her husband and, and the report said that there were allegations of domestic abuse over about 12 months before she died. Um, you can see there that bruising or injuries were, were noted on a number of occasions and uh, within three months of the wife's death, there were three incidents that led to police involvement. And the final incident following which the wife died, um, he was described as attacking his wife, punching and kicking her in the face. The police and the ambulance attended um, uh, and uh, sh she'd clearly been injured in the attack, but she didn't want to go into hospital. Uh, she wasn't seen by any agency. She didn't seek help from primary care or from secondary care. And then 12 days after the incident, she collapsed. And at post-mortem, uh, it was found that it was a consequence of the assault that she died. Um, so it became a domestic homicide and then a domestic homicide review was carried out. Um, but that was that was a very sad case. She'd wanted to look after him. She'd wanted to carry on looking after him. Um, but it had been very difficult. And um, despite the uh, services knowing that um, she was being hurt and being injured, um, it wasn't possible or it didn't happen that care was put in that 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 addressed the difficulties that she was having in caring for the husband with Alzheimer's disease. Can we go to the next slide, please? So uh, what what can we learn from all of this? Um, next slide, please. I think there are some relational factors that that might trigger concern if you're working with um, people in a caregiving situation. I think relative isolation is, is one of them. Um, and these are sometimes um, relationships where the parties to the relationship are actually reluctant to accept care. And, and sometimes that's because they think they can do it better. The caregiver thinks that they can do a better job and they want to do a good job and they want to be the one who cares for the person that they love. Um, but it's stressful. It's stressful for both parties. Uh, a long standing relationship isn't protective. So the fact that they've been married for what was it, 40, 40 years and had a good close relationship and everyone regarded them as a as a couple who were happy together and loved each other. That's not necessarily protective in terms of harm uh, resulting. I think the financial issues, the self-funding thing um, that I've, I've, I've read a lot of domestic homicide reviews um, as part of my research. And um, I think self-funding is tricky because sometimes it means that people are left alone to try and sort out what care might be appropriate for their partner or the person that they're looking after. Uh, and also there can be concerns about where this expense is going to go, how long it's going to how long it's going to last for, what what it's going to do to um, looking after their home and other aspects of their life together. Uh, I think that if there's a history of domestic abuse in the relationship, that's ob obviously a trigger, but it's it's not necessarily um, a feature in the in the cases that I've read. Uh, it may be in in some relationships, but it's not it's not essential that that's there to trigger concern. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, and then individual triggers for concern. I think in terms of the care recipient, if they have a high level of need, sometimes people used in the report that excessive care needs. But I, I mean, that, I guess in a way that's a judgment, isn't it? But people who have a high level of need for care and um, make big demands on the carer because of that high level of need for care. Behaviour problems, particularly um, situations where there is aggression, 
uh, abuse might be verbal abuse um, as well as possibly physical abuse at some in some cases uh, and where the uh, drug and or alcohol abuse can be a feature in the care recipient and and or the caregiver so it could be either who has that um, caregivers with a criminal history uh, with severe mental illness um, and perhaps who are not engaging in a consistent manner with services um, uh, care, caregivers who have difficulty in coping with caring demands and uh, people who seek help but may miss we had a talk about threshold didn't we but may may miss the threshold but it may be that for that individual caregiver um, this is particularly stressful even though they miss the threshold for having care um, and sometimes they're rejecting of help for all sorts of reasons um, so those can be triggers of concern uh, uh, with regard to an individual care recipient or an individual caregiver. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Aha, this is also a slide that um, a slide that I meant to put in. So I, I was putting in a slide on positive actions. Um, I think relational care is important in terms of the relationship between practitioners who are trying to work with the family. Um, and uh, it, it, sometimes, despite a high level of care being needed, um, people will refuse care. There's, there's a quotation that I'm very fond of, uh, which comes from a report by Alcohol Change on a number of safeguarding adult reviews that involved uh, alcohol. And um, the report's called Learning from Tragedies, and it's available on the Internet if anybody's interested. But the quotation that I'm fond of is the task of generating positive engagement is an important action in its own right. And I think that's I, I think for me, that's so important. And it's about the relationship between um, practitioners, um, people from agencies who go in to see people. And, and whether they are able to establish a relationship um, with the family concerned. It also links for me with professional curiosity, which is about trying to understand. So if this, um, if this for example, couple uh, where there's a high level of need for care are refusing help, why are they refusing help? Can, can I try and understand it? What's it about? Is there a form of support that they would accept? Is it something about services being inflexible? Or is it about fear of, of, of what it's going to be like with somebody coming into the house? Or what, what is it actually about? Can I try and understand that? Um, and it's also about, I think one of the previous speakers talked about seeing the whole picture. So that professional curiosity and establishing a relationship with the people um, it is also about trying to get an understanding of the picture as a whole in order to um, try and provide support that is appropriate to these particular individuals. And another part of it, um, which again, I think links with what other people have said earlier today, is about hearing the voices of those involved um, reading uh, domestic homicide reviews that involve older adults um, with a theme that sometimes comes up, not uncommonly, is that the person being cared for uh, doesn't have a voice. Nobody asks them. They go with what the carer, the caregiver says. And, and the extreme example was the, the uh, case I referred to. Um, where the uh, carer, in fact, um, e eventually um, caused the death of the person they were looking after. Um, and it wasn't that they were falling, it was that they were being abused. And I think the other thing is uh, multi-agency working, which again, we've talked about already today, um, because when, when you're on your own with the case, um, it, it, it can be that it, it feels very worrying, but if you can bring in other agencies, then that is a way of um, supporting the family and supporting you as the person who's working with the family. Um, so that's it. And I included some references which you can see on the sheet. Um, and can I have the last slide, please? 
which should have my email address on if anybody wants to email me. Uh, but otherwise, I've finished. Sorry, Kitty, did I go on slightly too long? No, perfect time.